Life Audio. Today we're actually going to go through two psalms, two short psalms, Psalm 125 and 126. The first one deals with trusting God in the midst of difficult circumstances when essentially Israel was under attack. And then the second one has to deal with the restoration process. And I think that's so common in our lives when we've gone through something difficult. There's also the flip side of that, which is this restoration process that we have to allow God to do for us to be fully restored. So I think as we go through today's episode, there'll be some things that you can take away that you can apply to your own life. I pray that it's a blessing for you. Stay tuned. This episode is brought to you by He Gets Us a nationwide campaign all about raising the respect and relevance of Jesus. Did you see the Super Bowl ads about Jesus? Are you wondering how you can get involved? He Gets Us is a multi-year effort to raise the respect and relevance of Jesus in the United States. Thanks to this unprecedented campaign, millions of Americans are discovering the life-changing impact of Jesus. And we want you to be a part of the movement. Join more than 45,000 He Gets Us fans getting the latest updates, inspiration, prayer ideas, and easy-to-share resources via text message by subscribing to our fans community. To do so, text FANS to 70193. By being a fan, you can get exclusive updates on new ads, events, and other exciting news related to the He Gets Us movement. We'll also keep you inspired by giving you access to reading plans, prayer guides, and other tools to help on your spiritual journey. Join this community of like-minded individuals who share your passion for spreading the love of Jesus. Simply text FANS to 70193 to join today. Hey there, it's Nicole Yunus, host of the How to Study the Bible podcast, where every single week we join together to encounter God through His Word. You can subscribe at lifeaudio.com. Hey friends, welcome to the Hearing Jesus podcast. Do you sometimes doubt if you're truly hearing God's voice or if it's really your own? And how do you know the difference? Do you ever struggle to feel confident in your relationship with God and what He says in His Word? Do you sometimes feel stagnant or like maybe you hit a wall in your spiritual life? Hey, I'm your host, Rachel Grohl, missionary, author, pastor, and life coach, and I have been there. I too was doubting God's voice in my own life. I felt insecure about my relationship with Him, and I wanted to be obedient to what God was calling me to do, but I wasn't quite sure how to figure out what that was. I felt like I was wasting time trying to figure it out, and I just wanted a way to understand His will for my life. The answer for me was found in the pages of the scriptures, as I learned how to understand what they were actually saying. If you're ready to grow in your faith and to step confidently into the calling God has for you, then join me as we dig deep into God's Word so that you can learn to live out your faith in your everyday life. Hey friends, welcome back to the Hearing Jesus podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Grohl. Today we are going through two Psalms today, actually, because both of them are very short. And I'm actually going to read them as if they were one. I'm going to read 125 and then go right into 126. And then we're going to kind of dive into them together. And the reason I'm doing that is I think it's important to understand restoration is part of the process after we've gone through a difficult season. And I think these two showcase that rather well. If you are just joining us and you're maybe a little confused as to why we're going through the Psalms on the Hearing Jesus podcast, I want to remind you that the reason why we're doing that is because the Psalms were the hymn book and prayer book of both Jesus and the disciples. And so much of what we read and see in the New Testament is a a reminder of what is said in the Old Testament in the book of Psalms. And so as we are striving or trying to figure out what it is that God is trying to say to us in our lives. I think a good foundational way to understand the words of Jesus, the thoughts, the prayers of Jesus is to understand the Psalms because that was a lot of what he referred to when he was teaching. And so we're going through one Psalm a day in an effort not to replace your Bible reading, but to really supplement it. And I try to give a little bit of insight to the background or the history or the culture that is so oftentimes missed on our modern readers. Because if we think about it, yes, scripture, all of scripture was written for us, but it was not a originally written to us. It was written to an ancient people group that had a different set of circumstances, experiences. There was things that were common knowledge to them. If you think about that, even in terms of location, there are things in our American culture 
that would be lost to somebody that is in a different country or things that would be lost on us if they're from a different country, you know, if we're talking about that kind of scenario. And so just even location wise, there's things that we don't understand about the mountains or the, the trees or the different kinds of animals or different references to the North or the South. And so I try to go through some of that to help you understand what they're actually talking about. I pray that this kind of study is a, a blessing for you. And one of the things I always recommend is trying to make sure that we're not just leaving it here. We're not just listening to this and then moving on, but really making sure that it is integrated into your daily life. And so it's not just about listening. It's also about obeying. And so one of the ways I always recommend doing that is journaling. Every Monday, if you don't already know this, you can go to shehears.org and sign up for my weekly newsletter. But every Monday, I send out a journaling prompt on each of these episodes that's really designed to help you get this information from your head into your heart. And journaling is a fantastic way for us to process things. If you would like the previous episode's journaling prompts, you can go to shehears.org and go to the resources section. And there you can find the guided journals for the Psalms. There's there's two different ones right now. There'll be a third one soon that goes through each of these episodes. So when you open up that guided journal, each day there will be a link to the audio devotional. There will be the space to actually do the journaling right there, the guided journaling prompt, and then also the daily key verse for that episode. And you can either print that out and write right in it, or you can uh, use it on like an iPad or a similar, dev similar device. And eventually we're going to have a print option available as well. So again, just additional resources to help you grow in your relationship with the Lord. And so I'm going to be reading from the NIV version today. And again, I want to just remind you that these beginning Psalms for this, this portion of scripture are from the group of Psalms called the Song of Ascents. And if you haven't recognized that, I would encourage you to go back to the last couple of days, last couple of weeks we've been reading. The Song of Ascents were these Psalms that the pilgrims that were coming to Jerusalem would say on their way. And, and we know that Jerusalem was at the top of the hill. So that's what the ascension part is. And so a lot of these, they would either say or talk about or were written on their way there, or sometimes when they've gotten to Jerusalem and they have completed this pilgrimage. So that's just to give you a little bit of insight of context. So I'm starting at Psalm 125, starting at verse one. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be shaken, but endures forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people, both now and forevermore. The scepter of the wicked will not remain over the land allotted to the righteous, for then the righteous might use their hands to do evil. Lord, do good to those who are good, to those who are upright in heart. But those who turn to crooked ways, the Lord will banish with the evildoers. Peace be on Israel. And then now I'm going to go through and I'm going to read Psalm 126 again, starting at verse one. And this is another Psalm of Ascent. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. Restore our fortunes, Lord, like streams in the Negev. Those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with them. So the way that we read both of these Psalms, they're a little bit different, and I want to go through them one at a time. So the first one, Psalm 125, is about trusting God. And so the Psalm begins with this strong expression of this confidence that the Psalmist has in God. And it continues on with this belief that the wicked people that are coming up in opposition against them will not be able to dominate this group of people that are the righteous, the, the people of Yahweh that are in the land of Israel. And so this is a poem and what we recognize it is, is a community Psalm. So we talked about a Psalm of confidence the other day, but that was an individual Psalm of confidence. This would be a community Psalm of confidence. So the Psalmist is writing on behalf of a people group. And so that being said, the Psalmist does request that God would uphold the retribution towards his his people group and the wicked that are coming in opposition against them and he's asking for peace for Israel 
And so there's a couple different ways of reading this psalm, but it all implies that Israel is under distress. Um, Now, while this specific psalm doesn't necessarily have verbiage around that pilgrimage to Jerusalem, it mentions Mount Zion, which is an indication that he's likely already in the city of Jerusalem. So starting in verse one and two, we understand this aspect or this topic of trusting in God. So according to the psalmist, there's this key element to a stable life, and that is trusting God. And so he's confessing his own trust in God, but he's also encouraging others to trust in God because he's talking about how those that will trust in God will be like Mount Zion. And so if you remember, we talked about this the other day, mountains are often symbolic with this idea of stability and endurance. And it is spiritually contrasted with the waters of chaos. If you remember the waters of chaos, we've talked about in Genesis, we talked about that back in Psalm 46. And so here, what the psalmist is doing is he's naming this most important mountain of all Mount Zion, which is the location of the temple. And so the mention of Zion at the very beginning of this, it leads the psalmist to draw this analogy based on the mountains. And you have to remember the location of where they were at, there was mountains surrounding them. We're actually going to pause right here for a moment. And when we come back, we'll get into the rest of this episode. Stay tuned. This episode is brought to you by He Gets Us, a nationwide campaign all about raising the respect and relevance of Jesus. Did you see the Super Bowl ads about Jesus? Are you wondering how you can get involved? He Gets Us is a multi-year effort to raise the respect and relevance of Jesus in the United States. Thanks to this unprecedented campaign, millions of Americans are discovering the life-changing impact of Jesus. And we want you to be a part of the movement. Join more than 45,000 He Gets Us fans, getting the latest updates, inspiration, prayer ideas, and easy-to-share resources via text message by subscribing to our fans community. To do so, text FANS to 70193. By being a fan, you can get exclusive updates on new ads, events, and other exciting news related to the He Gets Us movement. We'll also keep you inspired by giving you access to reading plans, prayer guides, and other tools to help on your spiritual journey. Join this community of like-minded individuals who share your passion for spreading the love of Jesus. Simply text FANS to 70193 to join today. Our world can feel chaotic and uncertain. But we don't have to live enslaved to fear. Christ has promised you and I his peace. And throughout scripture, he has provided powerful truths and practical steps to help us experience greater freedom. I'm Jennifer Slattery, lead host of the Faith Over Fear podcast, inviting you to join me and my team as together we learn how to starve our fears and grow our faith. Subscribe at lifeaudio.com. Here, God is surrounding his people, just like the mountains have surrounded Jerusalem. And the mountains are this protective element that that God has used as part of the reason why he chose that location in the first place. So when Jerusalem is attacked, the mountains are this protective element that is part of what shields them from an attack. And so it's kind of this analogy that reveals that God is protecting his people. And so again, we hear this language about lifting the eyes up to the mountains. That's what we learned in Psalm 121, but now we're surrounded by the mountains. And so there's this connection between Psalm 121 and 122 that is this whole journey of the Psalms of Ascent. And that's how we know that they are usually read within the context of each other. They would have been used in Israel within the context of each other. And then in verse three, it goes on to talk about the fall of the wicked. And so in terms of meaning and connection, this is kind of the beginning of the end of the Psalm. And it's, it's only what, six verses. It's not a very long Psalm to begin with, but there's this general principle that becomes clear here. It's that the wicked will not prevail. And so the psalmist is talking with this confidence that the wicked will not even get a foothold. And it's this confidence in knowing that you can put your trust in God and it's affirming this protective element of of this relationship they have with God. 
And then it goes on to talk about peace in verse four and five. And so the psalm is ending with this request that God would reward those who are righteous and good and punish those that are wicked and then eventually banish them. And so the final hope is that Israel will finally be at peace. And so what this psalm is doing all the way through is it's expressing this trust in the protective aspect of God's character and relationship and protection from these evil rulers who want to dominate the land of Israel. You know, one of the things we talked about yesterday was we pray for, we pray for peace for Israel as believers. But I think sometimes people get that confused and think that we always have to be supportive of the leaders that are in Israel at the time. And that's not necessarily the case. I mean, we see throughout history that sometimes there was some evil rulers. There's going to continue to sometimes be evil rulers. The the, the prayer here for peace in Israel is not to be confused with support for whoever's in office. I mean, of course, we need to pray for that person that God would intervene and God would speak to them and God would break their hearts for what breaks his. Of course, we need to do that. But praying for peace for Israel I think sometimes has to do more with the people of Israel and what's going on in Israel versus support for the political leader at the time. And so what our prayer is, I think, in this scenario is what we see in this psalm, asking God to grant peace to Israel. And then, of course, this punishment element for those that are attacking Israel. And then we go directly into Psalm 126, which is a psalm of restoration. And so Zion, again, this mountain where the temple is, it appears in the very first verse of the psalm, and it's probably indicating the presence of the pilgrims who have gone to Jerusalem already. It is a psalm of ascent, but again, I think the setting is more, they're already there. So the the last couple of days, over the last week or so, we've been talking about the pilgrimage psalms on their way to, and now they are actually in the city itself. And so the psalm starts out like a Thanksgiving psalm, really just celebrating this restoration that they're experiencing of the wealth of the city or the finances of the city. But then the second part helps us understand that there is this aspect of lament in the community. And it's interesting how the two fit together, because I think even in our own lives, if you think about times that God has done a restorative work in you, there is still a grief, I think, that happens when you're going through that restoration process. I mean, that's why you need restoration in the first place, because there's been something that has been destroyed. And in my own life, I think about that in terms of even just like our failed adoption story. God has done a restorative work in me. I work in the area of glo- of global orphan care now, but there is still a grief and a lament sometimes of what we had to go through and what still burdens my heart in that area. And I think that's so natural for that human experience. So even though this is a restoration psalm, there is still this aspect of lament because there's a grief over what has happened in previous situations for them to even need restoration in the first place. And so we start with verses one through three, where there is this joy in the restoration process. And so what the psalmist is doing is he's essentially marveling at the effects of restoration in the community. And Zion, as this holy mountain in Jerusalem, is standing above this whole city and an example to the whole community. And so that phrase, restored the fortunes, it's a translation of a verb whose root basically means to turn or return. And it appears about 25 times in the Old Testament. And in this context, it indicates this change of fortune for either the individual or the community. And so essentially, um, it, it's used in a couple different ways. In this context, one of the things that biblical scholars have come to learn is it also means that the captives have been brought back. And if you think about that, in terms of where Israel's at at this point of history, they have survived the Babylonian captivity. They have come back to this location and now they're seeing God's hand of restoration and doing this restorative work that probably was unforeseen for so many that had lived through that captivity. And so I think it's interesting that the way that that is used is definitely a Hebrew root. It's the way it's used in the Hebrew. It's not necessarily, um, 
it's something that is a, a widely held view, but I just uh, did want to point that out because in the ancient Hebrew, that is an element that a lot of scholars uh, believe that, that that's speaking to. And I think that makes a lot of sense given where we're at in Israel's history. Regardless, if it means a return from captivity or a return and restoration of, of finances, what we recognize is there's a reality of restoration that's happening. And the emphasis here is it's the kind of restoration that is so amazing that it feels like they're dreaming. And it's this condition that is bringing so much joy that they are responding with joy and laughter. And it's talking about how even the nations could only point to God's greatness to explain the, the reversal of their situation. And I love that because I think what it does is it gives us this beautiful picture of how God restores things that the enemy had stolen. For many of us, when we start off in that dark place, like what we saw in Psalm 125, it feels impossible to imagine being on the other side of that. But yet we serve a God who redeems and restores all things. And this picture of restoration that we see, I think is a pattern of what we see God do throughout our own lives. And so as we move on to verses four through six, where it's talking more about restoring us, there's the, the first part of this Psalm was about this joy that happens in this restoration process, but it's not just the restoration of their circumstances. It's the restoration of them themselves. And so it's interesting that the Psalmist would talk about first about the community's restoration being restored, but that's essentially what he does. And I think if you think about that in terms of what kind of culture it was, you have to remember they were a communal culture. And a lot of cultures around the world that are different from the Western mindset are communal cultures. And so if something were to happen to the community, that's there's such an alignment between self and community that there's really no separation. And so while he's talking about restoration, personal restoration, it seems as if this community restoration takes precedence or priority. And I think that's just a testimony to the way that that communal people group led their lives. And and I think um, it's also an indicator why we see things happen it, with large groups, large people groups. It seems to be that... Um, the even some of the barriers to the gospel that we see in that part of the region that region of the world now is very much tied into this community mindset we see this idea of restoration when he talks about when the psalmist talks about streams in the negev because that was a well-known area of wilderness where there was very little water and so verse five and six is then speaking of this emotional restoration where God is able to take those that are weeping and make them re rejoice. And there's an agricultural twist because farmers going without seed while they're weeping and then rejoicing as they return with the harvest. It's such a clear picture of that agricultural community mindset where everything was so intertwined. But if I think about this in terms of restoration, as this psalm is asking God to continue this work of restoration in the community and personally, there's this already not yet perspective that we see in the scriptures. Believers relate to this when we think about our own spiritual lives. Of course, as believers, we've made that decision to follow Jesus. We've been saved from sin and death by this redemptive work of Christ on the cross. However, it's not 100% completely worked out. We still live in a fallen world. We still suffer and sin and die in this world. But we also know that the future will bring this full realization of our restoration, both individually and as a people group, as a community of the body of Christ. And so we can rejoice in the work that God is doing in our life, even as we continue to pray to him, to ask him for restoration in our lives. I think it's a process. I think restoration is a process. As I have gone through restoration in my own life. It's not like the work is done. God does a restorative, redemptive work, and then it's done. I think it's a process. And there are elements of healing that will probably take a lifetime. And essentially, even if I felt like 100% things from my past were healed, 
we still live in a fallen, sinful world. We are still dealing with sin and the yuck of this world that is not going to be completely worked out until we get to the other side of heaven. And so I love the way that this picture of restoration reminds us that we can experience joy in restoration, even when things are not 100% completely worked out even when there's still things left to be fixed. Because what we see is a God who desires restoration. And how does that restoration happen? It happens through the context of an ongoing relationship with him. It's not one prayer, prayer for salvation. Okay, God, restore me. And that's that. And I go on about my my own life. No, it's this continual process of coming to the throne of God, praying, asking God to reveal things that need to be restored and handing things over to him. And then being obedient when he calls us to do those things that he's asked us to do. And so it's a this beauty of this ongoing relationship with the Lord that leads to this restoration process. And so given that insight, I'm going to go back to Psalm 125 and then read through to Psalm 126, starting at verse 1 of 125. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be shaken, but endures forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people, both now and forevermore. The scepter of the wicked will not remain over the land allotted to the righteous, for then the righteous might use their hands to do evil. Lord, do good to those who are good, to those who are upright in heart. But those who turn to crooked ways, the Lord will banish with evildoers. Peace be on Israel. Psalm 126, verse 1. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. Our mouths were filled with laughter, our tongues with songs of joy. Then it was said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are filled with joy. Restore our fortunes, Lord, like the streams in the Negev. Those who sow with tears will reap with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying seed to sow, will return with songs of joy, carrying sheaves with them. Father God, we thank you that you are a God that can do the impossible, that you can restore all things. And God, I thank you for the joy that comes in that process of restoration, even when things are not a hundred percent yet. Lord, we see this example of the psalmist having such joy in the process of restoration, yet recognizing that there's still work to be done. Lord, as we continue to humble ourselves and to lay before you, the pain and the hurt of the things that have caused us to want to give up or to feel defeat or to come to you asking and begging for help. Lord, we we lay those things at your feet, but Lord, we trust you for this restoration process. Lord, help us to be patient in those moments where it feels like maybe you're not working fast enough or things are not quite what we expected. Lord, help us to be overwhelmed with the joy that comes with seeing your hand at work, even when we're in the midst of the process. Lord, I thank you that you are the God that restores and redeems all things. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I know you've been frustrated with being confident in how to tell the difference between hearing from God and wondering if it's your own voice. Listen, I know. I've been there myself. That's why I wrote the Bible study, She Hears, Learning to Listen to Jesus. This is a six-week study that takes you through the book of John, looking at six women in the life of Jesus. It also teaches the color method of Bible study, which helps you to learn how to really understand the scriptures. I include lots of cultural and historical information, and it really makes these familiar passages of scripture just come alive. This is a great study to do on your own, to do with some girlfriends or even some teenage girls, and it will help you really gain the confidence in how to hear from the Lord and set you up with some tools that will stay with you long after the study is over. You can find that on my resources page at shehears.org, where there are also some really good resources to help you in your spiritual growth. I pray that they are a blessing for you. I want to take just a second to thank the team at Life Audio for their partnership with us on the podcast. If you go to lifeaudio.com, you'll find dozens of other faith-centered podcasts in their network. They've got shows about prayer, Bible study, parenting, and more. Hey friends, if this podcast helped encourage, empower, or equip you for God's call in your life, I would love it if you would head over to Apple Podcasts and leave me a review. That's the number one way you can support my show. You can also join our free Facebook community or Instagram page where I share inspirational tips, resources, and prayer throughout the week. Hey, I want you to know I'm praying for you this week. Know that you are loved, you are cherished, and you are His.
What happens when a writer and former history teacher goes toe-to-toe with his best friend, a nationally touring stand-up comedian? Total carnage, that's what. Two men enter, and two men leave, because that's how it works. (laughs) Actually, you get hilarious, real, and insightful conversations about life, history, culture, faith, and everything in between. Join me, comedian Johnny W., and my pal, author, and speaker John Driver for Talk About That at lifeaudio.com or wherever you get your podcasts.